Today on the Framework Coding Show, a bunch of things you didn't know you could do with HTML. Welcome to the Framework Coding Show, I'm Mark Lassoff. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into HTML and exposing a couple of tips and tricks you probably didn't know about. So warm up that laptop, get a cup of coffee, as I invite you to code along on today's episode of the Framework Coding Show. Tip number one, the content editable attribute. So this is a really cool trick that I haven't seen used much in web development. Notice that in this unordered list, we have the content editable attribute set to true. What that means is the actual content of this list will be editable. So I have a list of my favorite bands. Because it's editable, I can go in and make changes to the items of the list and even add items to the list. Just like that. Once the items are added, they're stored in the DOM and can be accessed by JavaScript for processing. Tip two, columns. Setting up columns using CSS can be really difficult, and oftentimes the columns you set up aren't responsive. Here I've got some nice columns set up in the web browser here that also react responsively. You'll notice as the browser narrows, it limits the number of columns, and as the browser expands, it adds columns to accommodate all of the content. You would think this took some complex CSS, but actually it just takes one CSS rule. Here on line seven, you'll see inside the story ID, which is the div which holds all the paragraphs of content, we've used the rule columns, 300 pixels, and three. And what that means is we wanna to strive to have three columns depending on the width of the browser. And we want our columns to be at a minimum 300 pixels. When the columns are less than 300 pixels, you'll notice they collapse into a single column. So the columns rule in CSS can be very handy for laying out long passages of content. You'll remember that the eye doesn't like traveling across very long lines of text. With the columns rule in CSS, you can improve the user experience with just one line of code. Tip three, the slider. Here on the left, you see a slider control that also has a readout of exactly where the slider is positioned at any given time. This is actually the built-in slider input, plus some JavaScript that I've used in order to read the slider as the user is moving it. Let's take a look at the code. So first in the HTML, the slider itself is built using input type range. Just like input type text would yield a text box, input type range gives you a slider. We set the scale of the slider by setting a minimum and maximum value. You'll notice our slider goes from zero to 100. And that relates to the minimum and maximum values that are set in the min and max attributes here in line 13. Value sets the initial value of the slider. So when the page loads, the slider value is zero. And the ID gives me access to the slider object in JavaScript. So obviously, we haven't yet referenced the number that's resulting from the slider. And that's inside these output tags on line 14. Notice the output tag is ID to slider result, and the initial value is zero. The script that updates the number as the slider moves starts on line 16. So the first thing we do is we get the slider object from the HTML using document get element by ID slider. That's getting the input on line 13, the actual slider object. That's the control the user actually interacts with. The add event listener method does just what you'd expect it to do. It adds a listener for a specific event. In this case, the event is input. The input event fires whenever the value of the slider changes. As the slider is moving, this input event is continually firing. We use an anonymous function structure to respond to the event. So every time the input event occurs, this function 
runs. Notice this function has no name, but is part of the add event listener method. So here's our delegate function that runs whenever the input event occurs. We have a variable called value, and that gets this dot value. Since the function is triggered by the slider, this in this case refers specifically to the slider. The value is wherever the slider is. So from zero to 100. So that's stored in value every time the input event occurs. We then get the slider result object, which is the output on line 14 and right here in your interface. We're setting the inner HTML of that to the value. So essentially we're reading the value from the slider and we're outputting it next to the slider right here. There's another event that I tried using first called change. And with the change event, you'll see this will function differently. I'm sliding, but there's no result until I release the mouse button. The change event occurs not as the user is sliding, but once the result is available. So that's why we probably want to stick with for this one, the input event. The only other thing that's relevant here is a little bit of CSS that I used here for slider results. For the output, I just made the font size 1.5 M's, which you'll know is 150% of normal, and the font family sans serif. <laughs> Tip four, placeholders. Placeholders are a cool way to label text inputs using HTML5. It's very simple to use them. Inside the actual input, you have a placeholder attribute, and the placeholder attribute has a value, which is the text you want to display. So notice on line 16, we're displaying the text placeholder equals full name, and that's exactly what's displayed inside the full name input. While this can look good and be really handy, you should be aware that these placeholders are not fully 508k compliant meaning that some people mediating their usage of the internet won't be able to experience this content. So for example, if someone is using a screen reader because they're visually impaired, this might not be the best way to label your individual fields inside a form. <laughs> Tip five, listening. There are a number of different events that can occur to objects you place in HTML. You can have multiple listeners going at the same time, to detect these different events. On the left-hand side of your screen, I've got a browser open, and I've also got the developer's console open. That's where we're gonna see the actual events. For example, if I move the mouse over the button, notice a mouse over event occurs. We also get information about the event displayed. If I type here in the type something field, notice that other events are firing creating results here in the console. Let's take a look at the different events. Looks like we've got five events firing here. So the first event is getting the input. There's only one input here. So we use document get elements by tag name, which gets all the elements that have the tag name input. In this case, there's just the one that has the tag name input on line 22. But because get elements by tag name returns an array, we've got to specify element zero. It only returned one element, but it's still in an array form. So the first one returned is element zero. You'll remember that JavaScript is zero indexed, meaning that all arrays start with zero. So to the input, we're going to add an event listener, listening for the input event. The input event occurs whenever a character is input. So you'll notice that it is responding to every keystroke. And when the input event occurs, we're going to take the characters that are inside of the text box and set them to a variable called characters. We obtain them with this dot value. Since the source of the event is the text box. This in this case is the text box. The value is whatever has been typed into the text box. So each time the input event occurs, we'll console log out text is changed. 
the value of the text, which is the characters in it. And if there are more than 10 characters, we're going to alert out too many characters. So if I type my name, when I get to the 10th character, we get that alert because of this if statement, and it's not going to let us type anymore. This can be really useful if you want to try and limit the number of characters inside of a text box for input validation or any other reason. But the event that's tripping this is the input event. We also have on the text box a focus out event. And that's when this box loses focus. I'm gonna refresh, I'm gonna type a few characters, and then I'm gonna click outside the box. And notice we get here in the developer's console, the text all done. And that's because we've added the focus out event, the object loses focus, to the text box with document get element by tag name, input sub zero, because get elements by tag name returns an array, add event listener focus out. And the function that runs is simply this function that logs out console log all done. We also have on the button three events, a mouse enter, a mouse out, and a click. So on a mouse enter event, that's whenever the mouse enters the space occupied by the button. Watch my mouse and watch the console. There is the mouse enter event. The mouse out event is the opposite event. The mouse leaves the button. Now you'll notice here, we're getting information about the event itself. Here it says mouse over, and then here we have all the information about the event. For example, the X and Y coordinates where it occurred, whether or not the Alt key and the Shift key were held. We can use this to delineate more information about the event and use it in our code. The way we get that is by passing the event object into the delegate function. Notice here we have the mouse out event. Here's our delegate function. It's anonymous, there's no name, and it's part of the add event listener method. We capture this E in the parameters, and then we console log the E out. The E is the event, and that's all of these parameters that you're seeing about the event that just occurred. This is really useful. I find this especially useful actually for making games in HTML and JavaScript, but there's a million other ways you can use information about the event. The last event we have here is a click. When we click, we get information about the click event. Click, click, click. Now be aware, on mobile devices, there is no mouse out or a mouse enter. So you've gotta be aware of the different events that you use in your HTML and JavaScript when you're targeting your project to mobile screens. Tip six, headers and footers. Oftentimes when we're using HTML5 for mobile or even just for web-based projects, we wanna have a fixed header and footer as part of our output, as you see here. The position of the header and footer isn't moving when I move the mouse. The footer, in fact, is stuck right on the bottom of the screen. If we were to move this, you can see the footer here seems to be stuck on the bottom no matter what I do. Okay, so let's take a look at how the header and footer are created. In the HTML, I use the HTML5 header and footer tags for the content. That should be pretty straightforward. The header just has the words framework television. The footer just has the copyright. For the header and footer, we used the following CSS. We set the font family to Arial, the size of the text to 1.75M or 175% of normal. We align text to the center. We set a background color. We set the width to 100% and a padding of five. I'm rethinking that now, I want some more padding. So I'm gonna add 10 pixels to that and refresh my screen. I think that looks better. That's added to both header and footer because it's common to both the header and footer. For the footer itself, in order to lock it to the bottom of the screen, 
we had to use the positioning rule and position it as fixed and fix it to the bottom at zero pixels. If we set it to 10 pixels like this, now notice it floats 10 pixels from the bottom. So when you see this bottom rule, you have to think from the bottom. So that will lock it back on the very bottom of the screen. So there you have a header and footer positioned correctly using HTML and CSS. <laughs> Tip seven, suggestions. You all have seen this type of interaction before where a user types and suggestions appear under the input box that are relevant to what the user is typing. That's actually done with some pretty simple HTML. We're gonna use a tag called a data list. So notice here, as I type A, B, it's gonna eliminate possibilities that are not relevant. And then the user can click and it'll auto-complete the text field. So we do this first of all with a normal input. Input type equals text. And then we have a list attribute. And that refers to the ID of the data list that we're gonna use with the input. And here we just use a series of options to enumerate each option that'll be part of the data list. So you can see all the options here. And as we type them, they become available for the user to click. Notice that there's nothing inside the option element. There's nothing inside between the option opening tag and closing tag. It's actually the value that's used to populate the input. Pretty cool way to make suggestions inside of an input. I hope you enjoyed these HTML tips and tricks. If you did or just thought they were neat, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the little bell so you can be reminded whenever we come out with a new video. I'm Mark Lassoff for Framework Television. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.